Hello and welcome to the second instalment of the Tolly Exam Training Masterclasses. I'm Simon Groom and I'm Head of National Tax Training at Tolly. And with me today is Chris Jones and he's Director of Tax and Accountancy. The title of today's session is Lost in Legislation. We're looking at the legislation books that you can take into the ATT and CTA examinations and we're going to try and give you some tips on how you can increase your exam marks and increase your chances of passing. So first of all, what do we mean when we talk about the legislation? Well, I hope they're reasonably familiar to you now, but what we're looking at is first of all the yellow books and also we've got the uh, orange tax handbooks. And as I say, both of these you can take into the ATT and CT ex examinations with you. Before you get started on using the legislation, really you need to be familiar with what it actually contains and you need to know your way around the legislation. So we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at what the contents of each of the books are. So I'm going to start with uh, Book 1A. Now, uh, essentially, if we look at the yellow book, we've got three volumes in Book 1. We've got 1A, 1B and 1C. And the key thing is that everything within Book 1 uh, covers income tax, corporation tax and capital gains tax. One thing, just a word of warning, we get a lot of queries about national insurance and people saying they can't find anything in nation on national insurance. Um, and that's because national insurance is contained in one of the later books. So make sure you're looking for uh, income tax, corporation tax and CGT. Now, the thing about book one, and in particular book 1A, um, is it contains uh, basically the tax statutes. And it contains the tax statutes in chronological order going back to, well, mainly back to 1970 with the first major act, um, but going right up to the present day. Um, one of the key things you will notice on the side of the book is that certain of the uh, pages are shaded. You can see these are shaded grey. What we have here are the major uh, pieces of tax statute, the Consolidation Acts. The parts that aren't shaded uh, in between those are the, uh, are the Finance Acts and also some of the more minor acts. So the first thing to know, if you're looking for one of the key tax statutes, then it's going to be part of the grey shading here. So what do we actually have uh, in Book 1A? Well, we've got three bits of shading here. The first one at the beginning, not very big, uh, is the Taxes Management Act 1970. And this covers, as you would expect, administration. Um, mainly income tax administration. Um, corporation tax administration is dealt with elsewhere. Um, but there are some useful things in there. The second main part um, is the Income and Corporation Taxes Act of 1988. Now, it looks a large piece of legislation, but actually most of the provisions of those, that bit of legislation um, have been replaced by uh, newer acts. So actually, you probably won't see many references in your study notes to uh, the Income and Corporation Taxes Act, or ICTA, as it's often known. The final sort of major tax statute in Book 1A uh, is the, t the Taxation of Chargeable Gains Act of 1992. And this covers the rules for capital gains tax for individuals, uh, but also for companies as well. So things like um, the reliefs, principal private residence relief, uh, things like rollover relief, gift relief, etc. And as we say, the, the bits without any shading uh, are the Finance Act. So for example, um, what we've got is a number of Finance Act after the Taxation of Chargeable Gains Act here. Um, the most important of those acts probably is Finance Act 1998, which actually has a very useful piece uh, in Schedule 18 of uh, Corporation Tax uh, Administration. So, Chris, I think you've got, um, you've got 1B over there, haven't you? Yep, that's uh, um, 1B. So, obviously, that's the second book. It's simply, it is book one. It's part one that contains all of the main acts. But uh, because there's such a large amount of UK tax legislation, uh, physically publishing it all in one uh, is very difficult to do. So, we've actually got a separate part here, which is 1B, which I'd just like to explain what the main grade 
um, shaded areas here are that relates to the main acts. The first of which, this first bit at the beginning here, is the Capital Allowances Act of 2001. There's some particularly useful things in the uh, Capital Allowances Act because it gives us a definition of plant and machinery. Um, section 21, what is a building, so therefore not plant. Uh, section 22 includes a list of structures which are not plant. And Section 23 includes a list of thing, items that uh, look like a building, um, a structure, but are plant. So almost like a reverse definition. And therefore, if you're dealing with particularly a written answer in the exam or part of a longer computational question where you have to decide capital allowances and whether something is eligible for capital allowances, you'll find that in sort of three sections that follow each other in this first part of Book 1B. Turning now to the next sort of main consolidated act in, uh, part one, in Book 1B is ITEPRA of 2003. So this obviously deals with the, um, anything to do with employment income. And there's loads and loads of useful stuff in here. It's a consolidated act. As Simon said earlier, the original provisions were in ICTA 88, but they've now all been consolidated into a new act, self-contained for everything relating to employment. So things like... Um, how to tax employment income, benefits in kind, exempt benefits, and various schedules you'll find at the end of the Act. So the schedules are always at the end of each Act, um, following in numerical order. So uh, schedules two to five can be very useful. For example, when you're dealing with a written question on share incentive plans and you're asked to compare and contrast them, you'll find schedule two deals with approved incentive plans. Schedule three deals with SAYE option plans. Schedule 4 deals with the CSOP plan and the Enterprise Management Incentives. They're all included in Schedule 5, so you'll find it all in one place. You'll tend to find an exam question that deals with share plans, therefore, is very easy to find the bits that you need in the legislation. So something that could be particularly useful in the exam hall, where there's a lot of detail sometimes to uh, remember. And finally, with this book, we've got the ITOIA, the, um, the other consolidated act, the um, this stands for the Income Tax Trading and Other Income Act of 2005 and you'll find in there all of the details relating to um, how we tax trading income, property income and what might be really useful will be things like whether an expense is deductible and there's a whole sort of area of the Act which you'll find at the sections that sort of denote each Act so uh, at the beginning there's a table of contents and you'll find in there where you'll find whether an expense is allowable for tax purposes or not. So what logically comes after 1B? Well, I think we'll find that that's actually 1C. So, Simon, you've got book 1C. What's in there? Um, yeah, I have, Chris. Thank you. Um, book 1C, following on from what Chris was saying, uh, a couple of the main acts in part 1B uh, were the uh, Earnings and Pensions Act, the Income Tax Earnings and Pensions Act, and also the Trading and Other Income Act, ITOIA. Um, those two acts deal with specific bits of uh, income. So, so the... Uh, uh, earnings line in your computation and also the trading line in your computation. If you get onto Book 1C, the first, the first act that we come to uh, is the Income Taxes Act of 2007. Now, basically this contains all of the rules to do with the income tax computation as a whole. So don't think of any specific type of income. Think of all the, things that, the other things that go to make up uh, the income tax. For example, uh, it'll have the rules on personal allowances. Uh, it will tell you how to calculate your income tax bill, um, and it will also uh, deal, with, um, deal with loss reliefs. The second thing we've got in the, corporation, uh, sorry, in the uh, uh, Part 1C uh, is the Corporation Tax Act of 2009. Now, effectively, the Corporation Tax Act uh, is the equivalent for corporation tax of uh, ITOIA. So, for example, if you've got a rule for, let's say, uh, business entertaining, section 47 in ITOIA, you've actually got the same provision relating to companies uh, in section 1300 uh, of the Corporation Tax Act. And yes, uh, that is section 1300. I know it does sound um, uh, very scary, but those are the corporation tax uh, rules. Um, they couldn't fit all the corporation tax stuff into one act, so we also have the Corporation Tax Act of 2010, uh, which contains more, uh, more corporation tax rules. Uh, and then finally, or virtually finally in this book, you've got uh, the Taxation uh, International uh, Act, uh, or TIOPA as it's known. And 
Uh, that deals with all the rules relating to the international aspects of corporation tax. Um, you're unlikely to be interested in that unless you're doing uh, the ACT advisory route uh, at CTA. So that deals with uh, Book 1C. Uh, and that finishes off all of our tax statutes. So everything in book one, the three volumes, are all tax statutes. So after book one, we, uh, we have book two. And Chris, uh, I think you've been looking at that one. Yes, I have, Simon. So moving to part two, uh, we basically have uh, uh, the extra material, which is, um, can contain some really uh, useful provisions within the uh, um, uh, that's going to help you in the exam, particularly in part two, is things like statutory instruments, um, revenue interpretations, press releases, HMRC codes of practice. It's worth flicking through and seeing what's in there because there's certain key things in there that you'll find particularly useful um, in the exam hall. So have a flick through because part two is one that perhaps you wouldn't normally um, think to pick up. But I just want to run through a few things that you might find particularly useful. Uh, for example, um, the statutory instruments, now they're all the, the sort of big chunk of the uh, book here at the beginning. All this area here, all this shaded area here, again, it's all in chronological order. But you will find um, statutory instrument 1998, so the year it was, it, it was uh, uh, enacted, number 3175. And that deals with the um, area of payment of tax by large companies, by instalment. And therefore, if you want to remind yourself of the rules, you've got a written or computational question on that, and there's something that's a bit of a mind blocker there, then you'll find that in that section. But one area which is particularly useful uh, and worth knowing is in existence is uh, um, SI 2003, number 2682. And if you get any question whatsoever, particularly a horrible written question about how PAYE works, it's all there. It's, and what's good about statutory instruments, they're written in uh, less jargon. It's much more straightforward English which is used, and therefore something will be very relevant and, and you can actually use very easily in the exam hall. There's also various other miscellaneous things. I just want to pick up a, a couple of those that will help you, particularly with written answers. HMRC 6 is HMRC's new guidance. It used to be uh, IR 20 that dealt with this whole area of residence and domicile. And that's quite a complex area, particularly relevant to those of you doing uh, the advisory paper for personal tax, but also can come up um, uh, as part of questions in the ATT personal tax paper as well. But loads on HMRC 6 in there, that's really useful stuff. And therefore, if you uh, are studying those areas, I would recommend you are all over HMRC 6 and know what's in there, because it's very topical at the moment, because HMRC 6 has only very recently been published. The examiner knows that, and therefore something he might well ask some questions on. Another favourite candidate that the examiner has on a very sort of uh, a subjective topic, i.e. one where you're going to get a lot of written questions on, is whether somebody's employed or self-employed. And uh, there's an uh, HMRC booklet that repeats uh, their understanding of the rules in employed and self-employed, and therefore if you've got a, a status question or anything around IR35 that links to that, then you'll find that in the miscellaneous sections 3 and 5. So. It's worth investing a bit of your time. I know this might seem a bit sad, but set a couple of hours aside um, and take yourself through a bit of nighttime reading. Find out and have that by your bedside, part two. Know what's in there because it will be your friend in the exam hall. And what comes after part two? But part three, which is the next book I have in front of me here. And uh, that contains, as Simon was mentioning earlier, all those sort of fringe taxes, those things that you perhaps rather forget exist because you haven't got, quite got round to studying them? Well, fear not. Some of the answers can be found here. IHT is great because, you know, you've got in paper, uh, one of the ATT papers, you know, you've got a paper virtually on IHT and there's not very much there. And the nice thing with the IHT Act, it follows through in a really logical order and it's very easy to follow through with nice clear sections at the top. NIC, something that we don't always... Uh, think to uh, read much about, Simon. I think you'll, you'll agree with that. Um, our NIC knowledge sometimes can be a bit weak in the exam, and the examiner knows that. Well, it's all there, second blob in, book, in part three. There you'll find all the NIC rules. Tax credits, they're part of the exam syllabus. It's uh, um, ATT, you need to know quite a bit about the workings of the tax credit system. At CTA, you need to know how that interacts with tax planning. All the rules are there. 
and uh, various things that you'll find particularly useful, but all the statutory instruments, extra material relating to those areas of tax, all contained in one book. So if that's an area that uh, is going to be important in your exam, know what's in there. Again, that's something else to pile by the side of your bed um, as part of your bedtime reading. So that sort of uh, deals with the main things that I want to deal with on the, the yellow books. But there's another colour book we've been talking about, isn't there, Simon, that um, you held out earlier? There is. The S, Chris. Thank you. There's, um, there's the, uh, the orange book, or, or these days, there's the orange books, because we've, um, we've actually got two volumes of these now. The size of the legislation is getting so much, uh, they, they can't fit them all into one, into one book. Um, but just something I wanted to point out, actually, uh, about the, some of the difference in structure of the books. Um, you'll notice that Book 1 dealt with income tax, corporation tax and capital gains tax. And Book 1 had only in it the tax statutes. Uh, part 2 then dealt with all the extra statutory material, the press releases, etc. So those, those things were di divided between Book 1 and Book 2. When we moved on to Book 3, you'll notice that for each of the taxes, you had all of the relevant material in one book. So, for example, the tax statutes, the statutory instruments, uh, the, the extra statutory concessions, the press releases, etc., uh, were all in the same place. So it's a slightly different structure in Book 3 for things like national insurance than it is in Books 1 and 2 for income tax, etc. The orange book takes the same form as um, Book 3 in that the first volume of the orange book um, has the VAT in it, and then probably less important, but obviously depending on what exam you're studying, uh, part two of the orange book uh, has all of the stamp taxes and the other indirect taxes in. And as we've said, all aspects of those, so the statutory instruments and the statutory stuff and extra statutory material, all contained in the same book. Again, the grey blobs we've got down the side, but this time if we pick up the, uh, the orange book, uh, the grey blobs signify the different types of material. So for example, uh, the first grey blob for VAT, this is the book, uh, book one or part one of the orange book. Um, we have the statutes and the second one we have the uh, statutory instrument, etc. And then we've got EC material, uh, extra statutory concessions, notices, etc. In terms of what's really important of the Orange Book, um, there are two things really. The first one uh, is VATA 1994, uh, the main VAT statute, and the other one, just to be aware of, in the statutory instruments, uh, is SI 1995 uh, 2518. And as Chris was talking about with PAYE, where you've got that statutory instrument which covers a lot of the PAYE rules, here, that is going to be your saviour for a lot of the VAT questions in the exam. There's an awful lot of information in that statutory, instru uh, statutory instrument. Um, it's known as the VAT regulations. So that basically concludes uh, our look at what is in the book. And now we just want to give you a few basic tips on uh, how to find your way around them. So Chris, I believe over to you. Yeah, well... It's all very well being able to be told in the exam you can take these books in, um, but how are you really going to use them? Well, the reason that Simon and I spent a few minutes just with you now taking you through what's in each book is you do need to familiarise yourself with what's actually in each book. So where will you find things? The last thing you want in the exam is to take your books out of their nice cellophane when they're first delivered to you, the first time you've opened them, because ultimately then you won't have a clue what's in there. So where is the Capital Allowances Act? Can you remember when I went through that with you? Well, that's in Part 1B, along with ITPA and ITOYA of 2005. That's all in Part 1B. Nice self-contained act on very self-contained areas of the syllabus. Where will you find how to deal with the sole trader losses? Well, those rules are in the Income Tax Act of 2007 which is in Book 1C that Simon took you through. Together with all the rules you'll find on corporation tax. So knowing which book to pick up from your desk is going to save valuable time in the exam. It's amazing how quickly three hours can go by. So don't waste time scrabbling around your desk looking for which book you need. Just know exactly where the, where the information is in which book and pile the books up in the logical order on your desk. That's just a useful thing so you know that it, it follows through. You'll find the right book very quickly. Now, can you write in the books? 
Well, this is extracted. You'll see this on the slides, and I'll read this back to you. This is, comes from the rules of the exam, which must not be broken. Publications brought into the examination must be bound copies. They can be underlined, sidelined, and highlighted. Annotating, use of post-its, and tagging is not allowed. But you can write your name in the books. So, that's the rule. Don't break it. Therefore, if the particular sections that you find are going to be useful to you. Um, when you come on some of our um, courses, the tutors will take you through what we think are very useful provisions. Things to highlight, things to know where they are, and highlight uh, the legislation so you know what the key things are. So, for example, you're turning up something on the definition of plant for capital allowances. You could might have highlighted just the key things that are going to stand out of the page. You're allowed to do so. You can underline them. You can make a few marks on the margins to sort of say, um, sideline. So yes, that's where that particular area is. You cannot write words though. You can't say this is really important or don't forget. Those any wording written in there, you cannot use that in an exam. If therefore at work you've been uh, using your legislation for say some practice work and you've written on it, you have to buy yourself a new copy to take in the exam or borrow somebody else's. Because ultimately, if the uh, if you are caught in the exam room using a piece of legislation which has got uh, um, annotations in it, you'll be disqualified from the exam. And that's not, you've gone to all that trouble to sit it. The last thing you want to be done is escorted out of the exam room. So know what you can and can't do with it. Highlighting can be very useful. So turning to the stage you're at now in studying from, uh, for the exams, how can you use these books as part of your studying? As I mentioned, you'll have little time in the exam to actually get used to what's in the legislation. So you need to know your way around the books now. You need to understand what's in there. So don't, uh, uh, don't just uh, um, look at the legislation when you come into the exam hall. Prepare carefully. Planning um, what you're going to write. Planning what's in the legislation and using it effectively can be your saviour in certain questions. So what sorts of things are the legislation books actually useful for? Well, you can't go into the exam having studied nothing and then expect the answer to come to you in uh, these books. Actually, it's probably fair to say that the answer to every single exam question lies in these books. But you haven't got time to look it up. Um, you just need to be able to go quickly to a section and know what's there. And it's a good aid memoir, for example. You're asked to write, uh, find out the definition of something for plant and machinery, or the conditions, whether you can do EIS or not, or whether the client in the question satisfies the conditions, which you then think, ah, oh, it's EIS, it's in this book, it's in this section, and you've nicely highlighted the key bits of those, those conditions, and the time limits for making claims. It's all there. And if you know where it is, and you've highlighted the key things, you will actually find it's very quick to get that part, and that's grabbing you very, very valuable marks. So don't you rely on the legislation to, in other words, forget stuff that you've studied, but use it there to prompt you on things that you might easily forget. That's how the legislation could be extremely useful. So there is a point of knowing what's in there. There's also a point to taking it in the exam and knowing how to use it effectively. As I say, it can be the difference between whether you pass or fail, because uh, ultimately it's only a matter of two or three marks and that you're the right side of the pass mark. If investing a bit of time now is going to give you two or three marks more, that could take you from 49 to 52, from 48 to 51, from 47 to 50. And that's actually a certificate saying you're now, you've now passed your examination. Time, I think, worth investing in. Now Simon's going to take you through an example um, as to uh, how you might adopt the use of legislation in the exam hall. So Simon. Over to yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Chris. Um, actually, just before we get on to that, I just thought I'd make uh, one point which I think uh, brings home what Chris was talking about uh, in terms of definitions, conditions, etc. Um, I was actually looking through uh, ATT Paper 7 the other night, and I noticed one of the short form questions was, I think, li uh, list uh, eight things that you would find on a valid VAT invoice. Now, if you've tried to learn those, you may well struggle to remember eight things. You could probably have a, a guess at a few of them. But actually, if you'd highlighted the right things in the statutory instrument that we were talking about, 1995-2518, then one of the regulations actually lists out the contents of a valid VAT invoice. So if you know where it is, you just turn that up in the exam and you copy out the eight points. It's very, very quick and you know you've got all the marks. So as Chris was saying, you know, for certain things they are very, very useful. 
What I thought we'd do, it's all very well for us to sit here and say, you know, yes, highlight your books and highlight them uh, properly and, and, and uh, sort of intelligently, but I thought we'd just run through an example uh, which would show you exactly what we mean. Now, there is a bit of a tendency with some people, they find a section and they think this is going to be useful, and what they do is they highlight the whole thing. Now, the problem is that doesn't do you any good because what you've actually end up doing is, is just colouring the book in. And particularly if you use different colours, which you can do, um, it might make the book look very pretty, but it doesn't actually help you in the exam. What you've got to do is selective highlighting. So, for example, let's say we were looking at something to do with the Enterprise Investment Scheme and we wanted to look at uh, the conditions for a company to qualify for the uh, EIS scheme. Now, the first thing to think about is, is where am I going to find this? And so you think about all of your acts, you think about things like capital allowances, well it's obviously not going to be in there. You think of ITEPA, so that's earnings and pensions, well it's not there because that's a specific type of income. Uh, you think of ITOIA, it's not really trading income, but then you remember that act which dealt with the whole income tax computation, the Income Tax Act of 2007. So you find it in there, so you know which book that's in, so you pick up your book C, and you turn straight away to Income Tax Act 2007. Now, Section 180 of that Act gives you a good overview of uh, the EIS scheme. And I'll come on to a mo in a moment to how do you know to turn up Section 180. But I'll come back to that. But let's say you've remembered that and you, uh, you find it in the book. Here we have Section 180, uh, which is an overview of the chapter. And You've got all of this wording, and I've reproduced it on the slide. Uh, you've got all of this wording, and you don't know where to start. Well, have a look at this for uh, selective highlighting. If we just look at the next slide, uh, I've got the, uh, the words that I would highlight uh, in yellow. So, for example, we'd highlight qualifying company. We've got to satisfy definitions relating to trading, qualifying business activity, unquoted status, gross assets, employees, etc. And it lists there each of the sections that those are dealt with in more detail. So just by highlighting those words, then you know what things are going to be, uh, are going to be important. And let's just take that a little bit further and to say, OK, let's pick up on the gross assets requirement in section 186. Well, if you go to that, Again, you're faced with uh, a, you know, a, the usual uh, sort of uh, w wording of the legislation, which is sometimes difficult to, uh, to interpret. But again, with selective highlighting, we can see uh, exactly what we should be dealing with in the exam. So for example, we've highlighted value of the company's assets not exceed 7 million before or 8 million after. And that's the key rules that we need to know. Let's just have a look at that with the, uh, the number of employees requirement. Again, a large number of words, difficult to pick up, again, particularly if you've highlighted the whole lot in the, le in the uh, legislation. But again, let's just pick up what we need to highlight. Pick, highlight as little as you can that will give you the rule. So for example, here we've highlighted full-time equivalent employee number must be less than 50. And that stands out on the page. Now, one of the things that people always say to us is, yeah, oh, it's, it's all very well uh, if I know it's Section 180 of the Income Tax Act. But there's so many sections. I mean, the Corporation Tax Act 2009, we saw Section 1300. How on earth do you remember all of those section numbers. Well, to a certain extent you don't. It's great if you can, but I would not necessarily set about learning them. If you know what act it's in, then you can use something known as the arrangement of sections at the beginning of each act, or the contents pages. So for example, at the beginning of each act, you have this called the arrangement of sections. Now, if you have found a particular section useful, say section 180, for example, then what you should do is go to the, the arrangement of sections at the beginning and you should highlight on the list of sections the bits that you found useful. Okay? So for example, uh, we've just got it here on the slide in bold, the overview of the chapter to highlight. 
uh, the trading requirements, the qualifying business activity. So you can open up the beginning, scan down the arrangement of sections and see immediately, oh yeah, section 180, that was enterprise investment scheme. And then you can see, oh, that's where I get the trading requirement from in section 181. 183 for the qualifying business activity, etc. So you don't need to remember the section numbers as such, but what you do need to know is your way around the act. You needed to know that for the enterprise investment scheme that you go to the Income Tax Act 2007. And as Chris was saying earlier, it's about becoming familiar, uh, about becoming familiar with those. And Chris, that's, uh, that's my little example. Hopefully that was useful. Um, you've just got a couple of things on, on highlighting, I believe. Yes, I think it's just worth summarising, based on uh, what we've talked about so far, and particularly from the example that Simon went through, just highlighting a few golden rules um, on how you highlight your legislation. Um, as Simon was saying, less is better than more. If you're using highlighting, um, and you highlight every single every single part of the page. Well, we may as well have just printed this on luminous paper. That is a, a waste of, a monumental waste of time. And highlighting every word except of, the, and a ah, is not particularly helpful. As Simon pointed out, be sparing with your highlighting um, and highlight the key things that are going to be useful to you. Uh, think before you put the highlighter um, pen on the paper before you do it. The other thing to bear in mind is that the paper is very thin. And therefore, if you're highlighting, I would suggest you put another piece of paper or some cardboard underneath so you don't highlight something on the page below in case it goes through, because some highlighter pens are cheap and nasty and can uh, highlight more than you want to. So just make sure that you're sensible in the way that you do that. Um, always highlight the contents pages to the axis, as Simon was giving from that example. Uh, you can see easily where you're going to find those particular sections and go to them fairly quickly. And consider using different colours. You might think, well, in a certain act, I want to look at things that relate to conditions for something. You might use choose one colour. You might think, well, something that relates to a definition of something, you'll use another. Time limits, you might use another. That's particularly where the use um, legislation can be helpful. Um, but as I say, you cannot and definitely should not highlight everything. But it is personal to you. It will mean something to you. We do not uh, suggest there is only one way to hi highlight. Uh, it's got to be meaningful, and it's got to be meaningful to, meaningful to you in the exam. So therefore, highlighting as you go along and using a consistent form, and then constantly reminding yourself of what's in there and what you've highlighted, means that when you go to the, uh, the book in the exam, you'll know where to turn it up, and you'll see the highlighted things mean something to you at the time in the exam. If you've highlighted it months ago, it might not mean anything. Why did I highlight that? You need to constantly go over what you're doing. So you know what will work for you, and highlight in that way. People use the legislation in different ways, so do what you're happy with. It's about you, it's your legislation. Love it, be kind to it. It can be very kind to you in the exam. Just goes to show how sad Simon and I have become. So how do you use it while you're studying? Well, you use it to do the highlighting when you're studying from uh, your study text. And uh, we obviously, in your margins, we give you the section references. You can then highlight the bit key bits when you're studying around conditions and definitions. And when you're revising for your exams and you're doing mock exams, use the legislation, open it up. The more times you use it, the more times you familiarise yourself with it, uh, the more you're going to be all over it. So when it comes to the exam, it will be your best friend. Look after your books. They're your books. Don't lend them to other people, because they might write in them. He might be your best friend. You've been studying with him the whole time through your exams, and then he writes something across your legislation, which means that, that that book has got to be replaced, and all your highlighting has to be replaced. As I said, don't, don't leave them on the train, but it's a bit difficult to forget a great big pile of yellow and orange books. Um, but be good to them, look after them, keep them with you and make sure that you know what's in there and make sure that nobody sabotages what is going to be a really valuable friend. So that's really what all Simon and I wanted to talk about with regard to the legislation, how that's going to help you in the exam hall. We've just got a couple of extra things we'd like to talk to you about, um, just to sort of give you some tips of the exam itself and a few things that might help you along the way. So Simon, what have, what have you got to, so what would be your key tip to uh, help students in the exam hall itself? Uh. 
I mean, the, the, there's lots of things I think, Chris, that, um, that that people should take account of. But I mean, one of the major problems, particularly at ATT, where students are new uh, to the sort of professional exam process, um, I think is the importance of, of, of time allocation, and it's it's fundamental that you have to attempt every question and um, if you leave a whole question out even on the short form questions then you're not going to get any marks for that question so for example if you've got a, a, a 10 mark question at the end of one of the long questions and you don't do that then you're scoring out of 90 you're trying to score 50 out of 90 um, and that makes your job much more difficult and people seem to think that if they get one of the other questions perfect, then somehow they'll get, they'll make up for it. Now, on a 20 mark question, you're not going to get any more than 20 marks, however perfect your answer is. So you need to finish at the end of your time allocation and move on to the next question. And remember, we talk about uh, the sort of the 1.7 minutes per mark. Um, so if you've got a 20 mark question, that's 34 minutes. Um, some people may have heard of 1.8 minutes per mark. Um, but if you work on 1.7, that allows you a little bit of time to look at the paper beforehand and a little bit of time at the end to review your paper so you're not rushing, you're not playing catch up all of the time. So I think one of my main issues with, um, uh, with, with sort of exam technique, if you like, is, is really time allocation. But I know you've got a, a, a bit of a favourite of yours, haven't you? Yeah, my my favourite um, in exam technique, and there's loads of ways that we, we could talk all day about this because uh, Simon and I obviously train people to pass these exams on a regular basis, but my favourite really is to make your job in the exam as easy as it possibly can be. There's a number of different questions. A good exam question will be structured where you'll find that there'll be a number of easy marks to get, there'll be some more challenging marks, and there'll be some almost downright impossible marks to get. And a good question will have a structure of different uh, um, levels of, of mark that they're after. You have to go in with the realistic uh, prospect that you're going to drop marks. And bear in mind that the pass mark is 50%, so you don't have to get everything right. And that's actually a good leveller. So therefore, as you think, well, I don't know that, I don't know that, I don't know that, concentrate on what you do know. Now, the other thing, as Simon was saying, 1.7 uh, minutes per mark is key because that gives you the time to go through the paper. You look at the paper and you think, not, oh, I don't like that subject. Oh, that's not a bad one. Oh, that's quite good. What I would always recommend is attempt your easiest question first. And that is a simple thing of go for the lowest hanging fruit. Imagine that an exam paper is a tree full of fruit. And what I see students do, particularly on revision courses, you've probably seen this yourself, Simon, that you get yourself very, very stressed because you concentrate on the stuff you don't know and you forget about all the stuff that you do know. And what you do is you think, oh, there's a, there's a nice big ripe apple at the top there. I'll go back to the shed, I'll get myself a ladder and I'll climb up the top and I'll try and get that. Whereas all the other stuff, you could, all you have to do is just sort of lean against the tree, shake it a bit and it's all there. So you go for the easy marks. And the number of times, if you see, it's a repeated theme that the examiner says um, on, the, uh, um, on his uh, comments, that candidates fail to get the basic marks to def define something. You know, didn't tell us, you know, told us about something, but didn't define what it is. Well, that's in the legislation as we went through. Don't, so going for those easy marks is going to be key in the exam. So review the paper. Choose a question which you, which, you, which you think is going to be a straightforward one to get yourself going so you're into it quite smoothly and then go for the easy marks. You think, well, I don't know a bit about that bit and don't forget about it. It's not going to come to you in the exam hall. It's gone. You're not going to know it. But it's just going to be one of those, the 50% of the marks you can afford to drop. And if you think about it that way and you keep that in mind the whole way through the exam, you stand that much greater chance of passing. And in fact, you can study and study and study for the exam. You can almost study overload. I wish students would study overload sometimes, but uh, it, it would be, you know, get yourself prepared, get yourself in that position where you can do your absolute best. But the key is in that exam hall, get it right on the day, and then you will pass. Right, I think it's, it's probably time to uh, wrap it up there, Chris. Um, I think there's some, some useful stuff in there. Um, if you are interested a little bit more in exam technique, then uh, there is another uh, Tolly's Exam Training Masterclass uh, specifically on uh, exam technique, um, and you'll find that, uh, uh, again, on the, uh, uh, on the website. So um, I, hope you've, uh, I hope you've found some of this useful. 
um, and uh, I hope it brings you success in your exams. Thank you.